hands up for the clickbaity title. I did not direct the main show, but I did do some directing. And there's a lot of valuable information about how I came to work on this mainstream show, what my experience was like, and how I was financially compensated that I wanted to share with you. The longest I've ever been consistently and solely on one singular job was seven and a half months from September 2014 to April of 2015. The better part of a year's worth of my life working as digital director on The Voice UK. As you might correctly assume, the digital team was responsible for any of the online content surrounding the show, creating both original content as well as repurposing stuff from the aired shows to populate The Voice UK's website, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube channel, as well as directly to the BBC's own streaming service, iPlayer, and some very niche bits for some new interactive platform tech that they were trialing at the time that I honestly can't even remember the name of anymore. The role of digital director was a Scott Peters classic. I was a self-shooting director, producer, editor, doing plenty of After Effects work too. But I did have a small team around me that supported in various ways. All who also had their official titles, but definitely did way more than they were credited for too. Our team was made up of an executive producer, producer director, producer photographer, producer copywriter, a sole copywriter who wrote jokes exclusively for Twitter, a runner researcher who was only brought on in towards the end of the process, a scriptwriter who worked remotely each week, and a presenter who joined us for relevant filming days and came in once a week to do a voiceover, as well as three more senior people who signed everything off. They were from the production company, Warner, who owned the production company, and the BBC, whose channels the show was aired on at the time. I think a lot of non-industry people watching TV wrongly assume that the broadcaster makes the show, but this is not the case. In the instance of this show, it was created by a producer in Holland via Talpa Media, who owned the franchise rights. They then licensed these to the BBC for a number of years. The BBC then employed Wall to Wall, a production company under the Warner Brothers family here in the UK. With the exception of one or two execs that work on the show, out of the 100 to 200 strong staff that made everything happen, crew numbers fluctuated depending on what stage of production we were at. Everyone who worked on the show was freelance. Even when the show went to the post-production company that handled the main show, Envy, here in London, the majority of the actual work carried out by editors and edit producers was done by freelancers. How does someone even get a job working on one of these massive shows, regardless of your department? Well, unless you start out as a runner, you're unlikely to have come from anywhere else other than either from a good recommendation or an existing relationship from someone already involved in the show. Mine came from the latter. For the two years previous to working on The Voice, I'd been in-house at a small production company in London, where during that time I'd worked with Mookie, an off-the-wall freelance producer who I'd come to work with in the first place because she had previously worked with my boss at the time. I don't know what her links to landing the job on The Voice were, I never asked her, but her role was as digital executive producer on the show. And having seen my work and having seen how I work before, she was keen to have me on board. The first season of the show that I worked on, which I think from memory was season four here in the UK, started airing in the January of 2015. But my role on it began four months earlier in the September of 2014 where outside of planning meetings, we discussed what content we were going to be making and learned what we could and couldn't do. I spent a lot of time between Photoshop and After Effects, adapting assets from the main show and my now longtime friend Klein's social assets from previous years, creating my first video for the show ahead of actually shooting anything, but mostly prepping graphics and end frames. Starting in the November, we had two separate filming sessions up in Manchester, where the whole production trained up from London taking over a large part of one of the central hotels in Media City. The show took over a number of studios in Media City, but as the digital team, we were often last on the priorities list. So we found ourselves working 16 plus hour days most of the time we were up there just to make it all work. We were shooting a lot on green screen to maximize the small amount of time we were gonna have with the main talent. So with the help of Klein, I set up a small studio in a disused space production found off the side of one of the main studios. Our production budget wasn't extensive, so I had the bare minimum in panel lights rented in only for our days up north. 
I shot everything on a Canon 5D Mark II with basic Canon 24 to 70 millimeter and 50 millimeter lenses and either shot handheld or on a tripod because I was usually handling the sound as well, according to a separate Zoom H4n sound recorder and trying to direct the talent. This was nine years ago now, but you can probably see from the B-roll in this video that a lot of it felt quite cheap and that's because it was. Things got even worse at the live shows when I was running around like a madman. A lot of the content we captured with the contestants was meant to be backstage, where the biggest challenge was not getting in any of the rest of production's way. Finding somewhere suitable for sound recording that wasn't too far off the beaten track between the main studio, green rooms, makeup, wardrobe, catering and the rest. So a lot of time was used up on these shoot days trying to either track people down or just walking or running between studio spaces. Back in London, smaller one or two day filming sessions started with coaches and contestants. But most of the time we were in post-production mode, even though we were still weeks out from the show actually going to air. As soon as they had a signed off cut of the main show, I was given a copy to start clipping from and working out how we were gonna repurpose some of this content. Versioning performances, clipping up standalone moments, and editing an online highlight show for which a voiceover was then scripted and our social presenter Angela would come in and sit under my jacket to record her voiceover as we didn't have the £150 an hour free in our budget to rent the voiceover studio upstairs in the very same office that we were working in in London. Here to tell you the truth, kinda, about what really, sorta, happened in episode 9. Even though I've never really loved the idea of routine and working in an office 9 to 5, not that this was nine to five, but I did really enjoy that side of things, working on this production, coming to the same place, seeing the same people, working towards the same goal. Everyone was working really hard on this same monster of a project in our office base on Gray's Inn Road in London every day, building friendships, familiarities, and working relationships that you wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity for if not for that repetition. We had one of my favorite Christmas parties of office working memory, and then production halted for something like 10 days over Christmas until the new year. Not that pre-Christmas was easy, but we really did hit the ground running in the new year. We had an additional team member who was there to work solely on copy and technicalities that I could never even begin to comprehend for a The Voice game app that ran alongside the show that our team was also responsible for. I began the very first day back after the new year documenting the press conference. I don't really know why, but content. Also on that day, I started my first adult case of man flu. It was terrible. Shivers, fevers, soaking the bed sheets, the kind of stuff that you definitely would call in sick for if you were at a normal job. After the first day when we didn't have any filming commitments, I called to speak to my exec producer, telling her how awful I was, but she responded telling me that I couldn't not work. We had deadlines for the first airing of the show that coming weekend. I could work from home, but I had to work. Freelance life. It was a long first week back. Once the first show aired, it was pretty non-stop schedule-wise. If it was an office day, it would be editing, voiceover recordings and meetings, and I'd be in at 8 a.m. and it wasn't uncommon to still be there at 9 p.m. Every Monday morning, I would collect a hard drive from a post-production house about a 20-minute walk from our offices with the now signed-off main show for the following Saturday. Because the post house was contracted in and not part of the production company, this cost us £110 each week just for them to copy and paste a file onto a hard drive that we owned. We'd normally have already watched the show on rough cut viewing links before this point, so I'd have a good idea of what I was about to set off clipping up, any performances and stuff we were going to use for standalone clips or for the highlight show. Klein, myself, often another producer and probably our exec, would often have ad hoc filming sessions with coaches or contestants at random moments in the calendar. Occasionally on weekends too, that had to fit into our now heavy post schedule. We were delivering a lot of content. For the first couple of months into the new year, things quietened down for the large majority of the production team of the main show. I witnessed lots of leaving early and browsing of ASOS during working hours. But for our team, things only ramped up. Occasionally, Mookie, the exec, would order us in takeaways if we were working to 9 or 10 p.m. But luxuries like this on our budget were few and far between. Even when we got taken out for a team dinner up in Manchester by one of the execs from Warner, we still all had to pay for ourselves when the bill came, which might to people that aren't in the industry sound a little spoilt to even expect anything else. But it's not really the kind of treatment that you would expect on a production, commercial, television or otherwise. There were 14 episodes in the series total, each one being signed off less than a week before it would go to air. 
and then the final three episodes were live. The live shows meant that it was back to full steam for everyone involved. For these shows, we shot in and around Elstree Studios on the far reaches of London. It was a mission to get to and from each day and production didn't pay for our travel as it was classified as a London shoot. Even though anyone that lives in London and has had the pleasure of going to Elstree will tell you that it is absolutely not in London. Production did, however, put us up in hotels the night before shoot day. Shoot day being Saturday night. And when we wrapped so late that the trains home were finished for the night, they also covered all our taxis back into the city. Show days were insane. There was lots of running around, often with our presenter Angela, occasionally doing scheduled things, but mostly just grabbing people we could find and trying to create content, whatever that might be, to put out on our various channels immediately. Having now worked with a few different presenters over the years, I've got to say that working with Angela was a real pleasure. She was a proper presenting talent in these instances, and she could create entertainment and just chat shit with anyone and everyone with no prep or practice. We'd shoot something with the remaining contestants, then I'd run back to the offices in another building off of the main stage to quickly clip something up and send to one of the other producers to sort, copy and post online. By the time we got to these live stages, we did have a runner with us though, who would help out in any way he could, including prepping footage in Premiere, if I remember correctly. There was a great sense of community, excitement and I guess pride by the time everything went live. Stress was high with everyone everywhere, but it was awesome to see everything come together week after week. Things like the dance performances and costumes, we may not have always have seen until it was all happening live if we'd been elsewhere during rehearsals. So it was exciting. A live audience with live performances, broadcasting live, no room for ups. On a few occasions, I was asked to camera up for the main show interviews after we'd gone off air. When the VT team, VT stands for videotape, which means basically the pre-recorded segments of the show, were thin on the ground and there was a lot to cover which my exec always encouraged me to do, even though I was stretched thin elsewhere, is that would buy us favor or an IOU with the producers and scheduling when we may next need it. One of the producers from the show would normally appear at this point, standing on my shoulder, asking the contestants or coaches questions about stuff that had happened that night. They would have been tucked up beneath the bleachers behind the audience with their own screens, making notes throughout the show. After the final, we had a big cast and crew rap party. I then had a week still in the office, finishing off editing the final wrap-up show, various bits of boring paperwork and prepping ready for the next season, which I did work on, but just not in the same capacity. When I came back for season five, it was to just direct and shoot a BBC iPlayer exclusive up in Manchester with the new coaches, and to then sit in a post house for a week as post producer. The reason that I didn't go back to play the all-encompassing role of digital director again on season five was the same reason that I didn't go back for season two of that BBC comedy show that I spoke about in an early video that you should definitely watch here. The money was rubbish for too long of a job with too long hours working with a team that was too thinly spread. The day rate for the role of digital director on season four of The Voice UK was £250 a day, which would have equated to £36,750 over 147 days which is obviously a fine rate, but as a freelancer out in the rest of the world, I was already able to charge up to £450 a day when I was working, and I didn't want to spend the rest of my life working on what at the time was deemed a lesser digital team for a Saturday night talent show, a sort of TV that I don't personally love. I can't remember exactly what the whole show's budget was, but as it was on the BBC, they didn't have advertiser money due to the way the channel is set up here in the UK. So things could only ever go so far, even if it was one of the highest rating shows at the time. I was actually invited back to the show when it moved to a new channel for season six, this time with a day rate of £350 offered. But I was already about that brand money by then. And when I said that I'd be interested if they could possibly make the day rate 450 I never heard anything back. The biggest thing that came out of working on this show, except for an incredible experience, a short-lived relationship with one of the main show's producers, a bunch of new friends, and an opportunity to learn, was the contacts. Fruit never came from anywhere on the main production, just a bunch of friends on Facebook and a couple of job interviews that led nowhere. But from the people on my immediate team, I've easily made four or five times the income that I made when on The Voice, from work that came from them in the future. Our presenter Angela insisted on working with me with a production company she was already involved with over in Ireland, making sure I shot a pilot she was working on, as well as hiring me as an editor on a couple of occasions to work on her reel. 
Digital producer and copywriter Gemma went on to recommend me at a bunch of social agencies she freelanced at, leading to loads of work with them. And then when she started her own agency, came to me for the bigger budgeted clients. And David Levin, who at the time had just launched a social agency that has since grown to a staff of over 100 and sold on for a boatload of cash, brought me into the fold of that company at its conception. I worked there in a freelance capacity for about three to four years before they grew to the size where they had an enormous in-house team. But I still get the occasional call up, even to this day, when they're pitching to new clients. If you want to learn what it was like solely directing an eight-episode comedy series for the BBC, then you should definitely watch this video next. And subscribe for more semi-helpful tips and interesting insider industry knowledge.